Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to review Skyhawk, Rolling Thunder 1966, designed by Steve Dixon and Bob Best and published by Legion War Games. Now in this game, you take charge of a Skyhawk jet bomber on a series of missions in a campaign over Vietnam in 1966 as part of the Vietnam War. There's two different campaigns in here and you can combine them into one big longer campaign. You can actually expand your one plane out into sorties of four planes and even expand that off into sorties of 16 planes for a mega experience. Let's get started with our power review. I think there's a lot to like in this solitaire game. Um, I really like the mission flow. I love how you go from takeoff all the way through. You're gonna run this North Vietnamese gauntlet of defenses. You're gonna finally drop some ordnance on the target if you make it that far, and then you're gonna try to get out and successfully land back on your aircraft carrier. Missions take about a good amount of time. They're like 30 to 45 minutes per mission. Campaigns, a good length in terms of number of missions. So it's a very accessible game in terms of game length and mission length. And the core action is really fun as you're going through this gauntlet of defenses and getting hammered by anti-aircraft fire and SAMs and MiGs. It's got a good tension and a good electric dynamic to it. The core gameplay here is really, really good. I also like the attention to detail in the Vietnam sphere, so it feels like you're flying a jet bomber in Vietnam. You've got political interference by the White House, which was an actual thing. You've got a variety of targets that have all got specific names, so you really get a sense that you're playing a solitaire game that's set in Vietnam during this time period. And that's a really good thing. There are, unfortunately, I think a number of weaknesses with the game. The first up is the rule set. Now the rules are brilliantly clearly written. So on an individual paragraph level, it's really easy to understand and be able to know what to do when you're going to execute the game by looking at the rules. So I don't have any troubles with the writing of the rules. However, the graphical layout of the rules and the overall organization of the rules made me feel like I was working a lot harder to learn the game. A second part that extends off of that is the organization of all the information you need in the game to execute your mission. And I felt like that too is a place where it was really requiring me to work a lot harder than I felt like I should have to, to be able to execute the mission and have fun with the game. Secondly, the more I played the game, the more I suspect that there's some things going on with the damage models of North Vietnamese fire against the Skyhawk that leave me thinking like it really needs some further refinement in order to get to a really excellent level of gameplay. Lastly, and I hate to say this, but there are a continuous number of places where I just running into things and saying like, I felt like there were details that were just left out. And it just kept happening enough. And usually those things don't bother me that much, but that combined with the game balance issues, combined with the way the information in the game was organized, left me feeling like as good as the core gameplay is of this game, it's 80% of the way there. It, it needs another level of refinement to reach a high stage of excellence. So bottom line, I think the core gameplay here is solid. I think you're a fan of this subgenre of war games, you know, solitaire games where you're gonna have a pilot or plane and tank and lead them through a bunch of missions in a campaign. I think you get some good gameplay out of this. Um, if you're a fan of the Vietnam War and that subgenre, I think you'll definitely like this. However, if you're looking to get like two or three games in this category and you wanna play the best games in this subgenre, I feel like Skyhawk is a little bit lacking compared to other entries into this field. Having said all that, let's jump into our detailed review. Let's talk about the core gameplay and why it's so solid. So first up, we have the Skyhawk starting on its carrier here, and this game board basically controls the ebb and flow of the entire mission, and it's really easy to follow along from stage to stage as you're going through this. Random inbound event, aerial refuel, then you've got to fly through this gauntlet of North Vietnamese defenses that are gonna be peppering your aircraft and putting damage on it and stuff like that. You're gonna go through target approach, target attack, and target exit. You're dropping your bombs here. There's a ton of tension in this part of the game as your, your Skyhawk is trying to make it all the way through to the target. Then after that, if you've got more ordnance, you can kind of come around for another run, or you make your determination to head for the carrier. Then you transit the carrier, carry approach, and you've got these models and mechanics and tables from which each one of these stages for what's happening. So it's incredibly detailed, and it feels really rich, and it's really fun, and you feel like when you get back, yeah, that was a pretty cool mission, and you did a lot of stuff. Um, I also think that like a lot of those individual tables, they add a lot of realism to it and you feel like anything can go wrong at any point in time. So there's constant level of tension as you're playing the game. This is really fun. And when you toss in the fact that you've got, for example, we have this target listed in Gazetter that's going to list out 
you know, there's got to be 30, 40 different types of mission targets here, all historically named and positioned. You really kind of get a feel like, oh, wow, this is in Vietnam. This is happening. These missions are tough. We could get shot down at any time. And it's pretty cool. And so this core game, this element right here, I feel like is really strong with Skyhawk. And in addition to that, you've got your leveling up system where you're going to get medals and all kinds of things like this as the campaign goes along. You can increase, can exp your experience can increase. There's just a ton of things that are going to be kind of added to your gameplay experience that are going to flesh out the campaign and make it feel really rich in experience. So here is our, you know, awards record sheet. We've got all these different medals we can win depending on performance on individual missions. So as the story of your pilot builds out, it feels really cool. And this part of the game in particular, this core gameplay element, is strong and rich, and I feel like it has so much positive things to add to the gameplay experience. Added to that too, the last thing you get, political interference. So the White House actually controlled a lot of the targeting for these missions during this campaign, and that can happen in the game too. So you get this kind of this connection to history that I feel really feel like enhances the gameplay experience and makes it really strong. Having said that, I do think there are some significant issues to talk about with the game that pull it back from that, wow, this is incredibly awesome experience. The first up is the rulebook and the organization of information in the game. Now, the rulebooks, to be fair, the rules on a paragraph to paragraph, sentence to sentence level are absolutely crystal clear. They're brilliant. Like I read a paragraph, it's like, I got it. There was like maybe two or three questions that I had and I reached out. He's got an email you can send to to get answers from the designer. He answered right away. Answers are really clear. So it's always really nice to see the support from a designer after the game's been published to answer questions. Had I think two or three questions, the answers are really clear. Nothing got stuck there. It was really easy. But that's not the issue. The issue that I had here, and in particular when we're going to talk about ordinance, I felt like this was an example as to where it happens. There's two issues I think going on. First up is the, the layout of the rules where we've got these long columns of text that really don't have any emphasis or color or indentation to tell you which paragraph is subordinate to another paragraph. I've played a number of Legion games and they use this type of format. And in other games it hasn't really created the issues that I felt like it really created in this game. Um, both trying to figure out which information and paragraph is subordinate to what, which information and which paragraph might be an example paragraph. There's very little visual help for this. And so as I was reading through the rules, and sometimes you're looking for a specific piece of information about a specific piece of ordinance, and the ordinance is here on page six under the Skyhawk ordinance card. You get these long columns of text. So you've got to kind of parse through the whole thing and you're looking for one little piece of information. And some of it is kind of buried at the end of a paragraph here. You're like, oh, wow, okay, I wish I saw that earlier or remembered it. So I felt like parsing this was hard, but then the other part of it here is there more ordinance stuff here on determining or ordinance load. And this actually has some important information too. And then you get up here to 6.21, which is dropping ordinance on the target. And that has some of the more specifications and specifics about some of the different ordinance that you're picking. And there's a lot of ordinance in the game. And one of the things you're trying to do is to figure out which ones do you want to take? So I felt myself kind of going through this and because there's so little visual help with this, it was really a search. Now I think you could just play the game and not worry about whether you're playing it right or accurately and stuff like that and probably ignore a lot of that. It might be because I'm making videos on it. Like I want to kind of get close to playing it really accurately. So I feel like if I had something or I remember, I remember reading something about this missile somewhere in the rules, I was kind of spending this time going through this and looking, where is the section about the missiles, the AGM missiles? Okay, okay, here it is. Wait a second, is there anything else here in the previous sections? So I'm bouncing back and forth for this information. So I felt like the structure and the visual layout of this rule book in particular made learning the specifics and some of the details of playing the game much harder than it should be. And that connects, I think, to a bigger issue which is the overall organization of the information when it comes to playing a game. And I think, again, ordinance is the best example I can think for this. Because, very quickly when you start to play the game and you get a target, like a bridge or something like that, or a building or something, the very first question you want to ask is, what's the best bombs to bring on the plane? That's a perfectly, that's the question you need to answer as you're planning your mission. And so the first place you look for that is in our book of charts and tables, 
on the munitions guide. And here it's got, for example, a bridge. And it says, oh, cool, AGM-12C on a bridge is plus two die roll modifier, as well as the Mark 84 2000. So maybe I want to bring one of these two because they're going to create more damage on it, right? So then I'm like, okay, good. But now the next question I might have is, what chance does the 12C have to hit the target? Because that could be different. That's not here. To find that, we have to go back to the charts and tables for the US attack tables. And there's a different chart and table, even though a lot of the die roll modifiers are the same. There's four here, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So there's 12 tables that give you the to hit percentages, as well as some of the die roll modifiers and some of the specifics, like may only be used at low altitudes, may only be dropped in water. These are for mines, of course, and stuff like that. So you get that, but this is the information you really need. So if I look for the 12C one, here it is right here, 12C uh, off target, 50% chance of hitting. So now my question is, well, okay, is that good or is that bad? Does that give me a better chance of hitting on um, a target or do I want to have the actual, would I rather have this Mark V? So I got to look back here and go there and I got to see, okay, that's plus two. What are the chances for this one to hit? And I got to go find its table. And then my next question is, where can I put it on the plane? And to do that, I have to look at the Skyhawk Ordnance card because this card tells me whether I can put it on the left outboard, inboard, the inboards or the outboards or the center line. It lists all the ordnance that can go there. So now I'm back in a, a third place to try to figure out this. And if I want to know the weight of the ordnance, I have to look on the counter because that's where the weight is. And that tells me how much, I mean, the answers, the numbers here give you that information, but sometimes it's nice to know what that weight is to kind of make sure it all works out. And then generally what I get here is like, well, I remember reading something in the rules that was really specific about that 12C missile, because I really want to bring that. And then you look back in here and you start to look at the Skyhawk ordinance card and you're parsing through this. And then here's the paragraph with kind of no identification or kind of highlighting on the 12B and 12C. And at the very bottom of it, you get note that the 12C is only used during the second campaign. See rule 14.3. It's also there too, but I'm not necessarily looking there I'm not necessarily looking in the second campaign if I'm playing the first campaign. So now I realize here, after all that, I realize I can't use the 12C. So now I got to go solve the problem again. And, and you get the idea. And it could be also in one of these other paragraphs, determining ordinance load. And then some of the specifics is again back here in 6.42. The bottom line is that this took me a long time to answer that question of what's the best ordinance to carry or what are some good options for ordinance to carry on a mission. And I guess I was playing it, I felt like this isn't a hard game, but wow, it's really making me work to get the answer to my question. And the thing that I kept thinking about, it kept thinking about as I was playing it is like, couldn't it all be brought onto one player aid that had all of the information from the charts and tables put in one place, the weight, where it can go, inboard, outboard, any specific notations or rules, the die roll modifiers. You could fit that all on one eight and a half by 11 sheet and then you wouldn't need information scattered all over the place and make the player jump all over the place to answer that question. Because it's a key question you're gonna be answering on every mission. The other thing that I was thinking about too is that these numbers here for the two hit rolls, they're just a one digit, there's either a zero to nine chance, right? And it's a 10% chance you could reduce this to one number and put it right on the ordinance counter itself. And you could have a six and that would tell you, okay, it's got a 60% chance to miss, a 40% chance to hit. And then I kept thinking, I was watching Oaken Knight's review of the game, who by the way, if you haven't found his channel yet, I just stumbled onto it the other day. I really like it. I'll put a link down below. Really thoughtful reviews and I really like what I kind of seen on his channel so far, Wargaming channel. So if you haven't found it yet, I'll put it down below. You can check it out and subscribe if you like it. But he, one of his comments was, it'd be really nice to have some of those tables on the map right here on the game board, like the high frequency ones. So you could have one number counter on the map, on the, on the, on the one number on the counter for the hit ratio, have the die roll modifiers, which by and large, like these are all the same for the top one, the first five are exactly alike for every one. You could reduce that to one table or maybe even a card. And then I would never have to dive into five places when I'm executing the bomb run or even evaluating kind of which bombs to bring on the mission. So that's a, like a perfect example of where I felt like, wow, this game is really making me work to do something that's not that hard. So the overall organization of the information makes the missions longer to execute and it takes longer to play and it does detract for gameplay, especially when I felt like there was so much potential to make it easier. Things just jumped out at me. 
Likewise, connected to that, there are three tables that you use all the time in the game. It's this uh, support fire on U.S. support units, uh, support fire against North De Viet defense boxes, and then the defensive fire against your Skyhawk. These three tables would have been so helpful to have on one player aid so that you're kind of constantly flipping back and forth in the rules to find these. That's another case where I, I like the use of charts and tables, especially for some one-off events and stuff like that. I have no problem with the use of charts and tables, but when they're high frequency or they could be condensed into something a lot more easy to use, it really did impact my experience and gameplay with the game. The second thing I'd like to spend some time talking a little bit about is the damage model systems for the Skyhawk when you're taking enemy fire. And I feel like there's two elements to this. The first is that you've got this really neat defensive the deep damage system. It's really elaborate, like all the subsystems that can take hits and the parts of the plane, like the cockpit, nose, fuselage, engine, and so on. And then each one of these subsystem systems can take two or three hits before they get knocked out. And it's really cool because on the way in, you're going to take a few hits. Some of them are superficial, but some of them actually cause damage to the plane. And you're tracking it all, and it feels really neat. But here's the thing, in 12 missions, I've not had any subsystem get knocked out. And sometimes we take a good, but good a bit of damage, but it's, it's never, never impacted gameplay. I mean, I've had like the nose to get checked off once and that impacted a roll. And then I think I had a pylon get hit, uh, get hit that impacted how we could drop the ordinance and stuff like that. But for the most part, I feel like it's a lot of time and energy and detail into something that from what I've experienced so far in about a dozen missions, this is really typical. Like I took two hits to the fuselage and then one hit on my hydraulic system and nothing else. And so it, it hasn't really impacted gameplay, which makes me feel like it needs a little bit of refining. Like I feel like if you've got a model that's this deep, it should really impact what's happening in the game, right? Because you get this tension and after a while it's like, well, I don't really care if I get hit because it's not really going to do anything. <laughs> and it seems to be the way out it plays consistently. I did look on Board Game Geek to see if I was the only one experience, and I did see someone else said they had played like 30 missions and had a similar experience to what I did, that this damage subsystem didn't really seem to influence gameplay very much. And so as cool as it is, it makes me feel like this needed more further refinement. It needed to be more meaningful in gameplay rather than kind of a historical record of what the aircraft look like when you get back. Like I want this to impact decisions I'm making and things that are going on inside the game, but it really didn't feel like it has that impact the way it's designed right now. Conversely, connected to this is the related, this is a chart that I feel like could use some refinement as well. And I, I, it's a little bit going into the weeds, but I think it has a huge impact on gameplay. This is what happens when the North Vietnamese uh, defenses fire at your Skyhawk. And you can get basically anything from a miss to hits and stuff like that. But right here, this number nine on a 10-sided die for MiGs, SAMs, and anti-aircraft, they're direct hits. And you are shot down. Basically, you're going to have more than a 50% chance that you're dead or captured. And it's game over situation here, right? So this is a 1 in 10 chance coming through here at the base difficulty of your pilot's experience. And you have to make four of these rolls. You have your support attacks, target approach, target attack, target exit boxes. So four rolls on a 10% chance on one of these systems means that there's a one-third chance that an average experienced pilot is going to get shot down on, his t on the run there too. And furthermore, there's three different systems. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's going on, right? You're going to have support aircraft that are going to be trying to reduce these. You can go at low altitude to make the SAMs insignificant. They can't fire at you, which is a really good strategy, by the way, because this is what you want to avoid. This is a game over type scenario. And here's the part that I think really impacts it. It's the experience level of your pilot. So a green pilot has a plus one modifier to this die roll. An experienced pilot has no modifier and a veteran pilot has minus one. So if we think about that for a second, on a roll of an eight without any influencers, a, it's 20% chance that a green pilot's gonna get shot down. So if a green pilot has to come through the target run, even getting fire from like MiGs or the anti-aircraft from two of these, that's eight times they have to survive a 20% roll. That's a 14% chance of survival based on just kind of some simple mathematic calculations. That's pretty brutal. Now, the weather is going to impact that. Your support aircraft, because you can put electronic countermeasures in there, that can impact that. But still, the overall effect on gameplay made me feel like it is really deadly and really hard to play the game at that green level. 
Conversely, if you're a veteran pilot, you get minus one modify here. So unless something breaks on your plane, as a veteran pilot, you're never going to get a direct hit or get shot down by MiGs. It's just not going to happen. So it felt like the green level of the game, which is kind of like a cool idea, I want to start out as a green pilot, I want to try to make it through, is particularly brutal to be able to get far into the game. Whereas conversely, the veteran level of the game, it's too easy. This just doesn't happen at all, if anything. You have to have that damage model create problems for you, but because we talked about the fact that the damage model very rarely impacts the plane's performance, it just never really happens. So you're looking for really outlier types of experiences that are going to end up shooting down your veteran level pilot. So left me feeling, again, this feels like an area combined with that damage model that, that there was potential here to really make this rich and to build it out, but it never quite happened. Like this needs to be refined, I think. The other thing I was thinking about with this is that it'd be cool, okay, like a green pilot, maybe it is really deadly, but could you amass experience and then level up to the experienced level and eventually the veteran level? And there is a system for that, but it's a simple after five missions, you get a 50% die roll and you level up. And that's like, well, it'd be, you could make that so much richer, right? It would just be really cool to elaborate on that. And maybe it's related to target damage. So you've got some decisions to make. Do I risk my aircraft because I want to get the experience and then I want to level up? Or do I kind of just take the easy way out to guarantee that I survive this mission? So the end result of all of that is that I feel like the gameplay, the core gameplay, after a while it starts to get diluted when you realize that the damage model doesn't really seem to match that much. And the most important thing that you want to avoid is those deadly rolls, those death rolls on that one to 10 die roll. One of the places that left me feel like the game could really be leveled up with this kind of potential to really take it to another level is in the targeting and enemy aspect here. So, it's kind of a contrast in detail, if you would, because the target listed in Gazetteer has actually all of these different potential. You can use a Navy target list or the Air Force target list, or then you have this Military Assistance Command. So you've got this incredibly rich variety of different target types, both from a historical and a gameplay perspective that go up in here. And yet every mission has the same four enemy defenses in the same strengths. And so it made me wonder, like, you know, there's so much variety here, and it's always the same here. It would have been really cool if there had been a system built into the game so that sometimes you didn't have anti-aircraft, and maybe you had a lot of MiGs and stuff like that, to create a greater variety of missions so it's not always the same four defenses to the same strengths. I always like to take a second to talk about agency in this game too, and I feel like the game does fairly well in that area, especially as you're coming in here and you're doing your support attacks and you're allocating aircraft on things to hit and stuff like that and picking altitudes. There's, there's a good number of choices that you're executing in the mission, and I feel like that's actually a pretty well-developed part of the game. Um, I will say though that there's, I feel like a, a fair amount of that agency, you know, like picking the ordnance and then kind of picking the support craft that you want to take with you, a fair amount of that is kind of obvious answers. And let me kind of use the support aircraft one for an example. So here's the things that the support aircraft can do. Um, these Crusaders can only go after MiGs. A lot of these things can only do one thing, and a lot of these things can do all of these things. So it really, unless you... Get, and you've got six of these and the most you can ever have with you is six. So it begets the question is like, when would you ever take one of these things, right? Um, because you can almost always get your mission coverage with taking the six best aircraft. So it's kind of like, it's an agency choice to pick your support craft, but at the same time, it's kind of like, do you want $100 or do you want $20? It's like, well, okay, I want the $100. So I'm gonna take these aircraft instead of this one. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of an area where, yes, you're given choice, and some of the agency in other places feels like that as well, too, like altitude. Once you realize that the leth lethality of those uh, one in 10 chance of getting shot down, you really want to be at low altitude so that you renegate the SAMs because the small arms fire can never shoot you down. So after you kind of figure those things out and once you start to figure out the best ordnance packages for different targets, I feel like a lot of the decisions become kind of automatic because there's an optimal path through them and they don't really change that much depending upon the place where you are in the campaign and things like that too. So yeah, there's agency. I feel like it could be improved. Um, you know, it'd be really cool if, for example, even if something likes to take agency away, that these are assigned to you on time so that you're gonna, again, have a greater variety of mission rather than always being able to pick the best ones and take them with you. The last thing that kept striking me, and these things don't usually bother me as I play a game, but it kept coming back to my mind is the attention to detail on some of the things. One big thing here, for example, this is your Skyhawk. Now, it's really cool that it's a big counter, right? But it covers up 
the but it doesn't fit in the box. And maybe that's not a big thing, but it also covers up the text that you kind of need. So if I'm here, do I put it there? Do I put it where, where do I put it? Right? So I feel like this could have been redesigned to kind of work better with the size of the counters. And likewise, down here, you've got these small arms anterior. These are the defenses and you're going to be dropping on things like suppressed counters on them and stuff like that. But again, it kind of covers it up and you're supposed to allocate support aircraft for that, but there's no boxes for it. And like, if there's boxes for all the stuff, wouldn't you want a box for this? Maybe you're supposed to put it on top, I guess, but that covers up the information as well. So it feels like, again, this little design element here could have had a little bit more thought and a little bit more richness to it. And there's a number of places too where the details really strike me. So for example, you can have an inbound random event where you get a luck token, and that allows you to reroll any one dice roll on a mission. You can save those over to subsequent missions, but there's no counter for it and there's no place to record it. So you've got to kind of fill it in on the notes and then cross it off and stuff like that. And there's plenty of room for extra counters in the game. So it made me think like, why aren't there like three luck counters and a little place to track that on your Skyhawk mission record card? Like just put it there. You know, another thing here, the altitude marker is on the Skyhawk mission record card. You're not really coming to this very often unless there's damage. I mean, that, that happens significant enough, but every turn you're trying to figure out the altitude for the aircraft. And it really got kind of, I kept forgetting to do that because it's way off on the other side. And I really wanted the altitude marker to be here somewhere so that I would be going to change it because you're constantly changing it every time you go into a box. So like a little bit of like quality of life thing. I was like, why? That would be really cool if that were there. Why is it over there? Because I keep forgetting about it when it's on a different piece of paper. Lastly, another, well, not like NASA, but there's another example too where, so these snake eye bombs here, I'll put the counters out and stuff like that. There's snake eye bombs. They actually have two modes. They have a fins deployed mode or a fins not deployed mode. And that basically creates two different types of ordnance. And you set these at the mission start and you can't change it. So if you do that, there's only one snake eye counter, which means you have to remember whether you put fins deployed or fins not deployed. And you can have some on the plate that are fins deployed and some that aren't. Would have been really nice to have different counters for this. Have one with snake eyes fins deployed and one with snake eyes fins not deployed. And especially if you put the, mark, the numbers for the to hit on them, then you'd be really clear what the advantages were of one and the advantages were of the other. So it's kind of a lot of these little places where I felt like it just kept popping out to me. It's like, wait, what? There's no luck counter? Wait, why? There's, these are two different ordinances, fins deployed. Why is it only one counter? Why is the plane bigger than the box? It kept coming back at me like, wow, I feel like this is 80% of the way there. The core gameplay is so good and so rich, but it's just that attention to detail, the way the information is organized, and some of the play balancing from those charts that left me feel like the sum of this game is lesser than a lot of the games that are in this subgenre. And that I think is really the ultimate kind of the conclusion that I would draw from this. I think that the core gameplay is good enough and it's fun enough that you'll get some really good mileage out of this if you just really love this subgenre of solitaire games. You know, you're complaining a plane or a, a tank or a submarine and stuff like that. I think you'll really enjoy this. I think this is going to be fun and you'll, you'll like it. You'll get some good gameplay out of it. It's not the, the best game in the category, but you'll like it. If you're a fan of Vietnam in that subcategory, then I think you're definitely going to like it. But if you're looking for like the top games in this subcategory, I feel like in its current iteration right now, it needs improvement. Those damage models, I think, need refinement. I think some of the attention to detail on the map and some of the way that the organization is, the information is organized in particular, really makes it a lesser experience than its counterparts in this subgenre. If you've enjoyed this review and want to see a review on a similar game from Legion War Games, I'm going to put up a link to Wings for Valor, which is a war, World War I type of flying experience, except where you control a squadron of planes. Be happy to entertain your questions down below. Thanks for watching.